So wa watching a few highlights of the relays from the United States track and field Olympic trials last week reminded me of an infamous baton pass gone wrong. In a relay race, the passing of the baton is vital. Well, the goal in a four by 100 relay is that four runners work together, each running 100 meters. So a small metal tube, the baton, is passed from one runner to the next within a designated exchange zone. And each pass is vital. Well, it was the 2019 track and field world championships and the women's relay team from China was right on pace with the other seven teams. And then the third runner attempted to pass the baton to the fourth runner. Well, this process appears simple enough to a casual observer, but unfortunately for the women's national team, the baton pass was such a disaster that they ended up being disqualified. So the baton is about to be passed in Deuteronomy. God's chosen people, whom he rescued in, from slavery in Egypt, and he's getting ready to gather, deliver them into the promised land. They're gathered in the sight of this exact piece of land that God promised their ancestor, Abraham and his descendants, to give them. So here they are. So after traveling 40 years in the wilderness, listening to the final sermon series of Moses, their chosen leader, God's chosen leader for the Israelites. So Moses is about to die. God's told him that. He knows it. So for at least one brief moment in the wilderness, Moses put his will before God's will. Numbers chapter 20 describes that. So he won't be allowed to enter. So God told Moses that he had to lead them to the promised land, but wouldn't be able to enter. Well, Deuteronomy, this final sermon series, can be summed up in five words. Remember the Lord your God. Well, then Moses spells out what it looks like to live in covenant with him. So last week we saw that chapter 30 is marked by hope that God would lead his people to life by giving them a new heart to believe and obey him. So today we'll see that chapter 31 prepares the Israelites for the baton of leadership to be passed from Moses to Joshua. This is God's chosen man to lead the Israelites into the promised land. So please turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 31. It's at page 172 in those black Bibles, page 172. This is the word of the living God. So we'll ask him to uh, open our eyes to see these great truths before we read. Would you pray with me, please? God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you have ensured that it will endure. Thank you, God, that uh, this word you have for us uh, in Deuteronomy, uh, th this chapter in Deuteronomy 31, uh, has endured for generations, for centuries, because of your good providence. So God, I thank you that there are enduring biblical principles here that can even apply to our lives today. And so God, would you give me wisdom to handle those rightly, even as I've asked you to handle me with your word this week. And so God, have your way among us. May your word be central. May your word, empowered by your spirit, do your work in your people for your glory. And please come soon. Amen. Well, chapter 31 has at least four themes running through it. The main idea that ties these themes together is that the unchanging God is always present with his people. So there's an outline in the yellow sheet in your worship guide and, and uh, with these four themes. The, the four themes are God's presence among his people, God's plan for leadership among his people, God's plan for his word to endure among his people, and God's plan to deal with rebellion among his people. So if you're joining us online, uh, look for the button at the top of Trinity Church, trinitylovesrippin.org. So please follow along as I read the first six verses of Deuteronomy chapter 31. So Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I am no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you, so that you shall dispossess them. And Joshua will go over at your head, as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you, and you shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. 
He will not leave you or forsake you. Well-known verse. You might have the refrigerator magnet. <laughs> when I was 26 years old, I got a call from my mom that my dad had a heart attack. I learned a short time later that my dad died. And I felt lost. I, I don't know how else to explain it. I, it's like I didn't even know who I was anymore. Just all of a sudden I had this identity crisis. I was the father of a four-month-old. I was in completely unknown territory. And now my own father, who had led me all these years, was gone. Well, I guess the family baton had been passed, but how in the world was I supposed to do this without my dad being present? Well, that's what came to mind this week, because I think of the Israelites. They, they lived for 40 years in the wilderness with Moses as their leader. Moses, a trusted leader, he's right with them. He's going before them. He was there when they were delivered from slavery in Egypt. He was there when they defeated the Amorites, the Sion and Og, the, the kings. So they could easily start to look to Moses as their savior and their provider and their protector. Instead of looking to the true God who had chosen and called and equipped and empowered Moses to serve as his chosen leader for that season. So God commanded the Israelites to then enter the promised land and conquer the people without Moses. So you can imagine the despair that they felt. Well, God gave Moses that wisdom to anticipate this. So Moses reminded them of the military victories that the Lord had already given them. And then the Lord, he, he reminded them the Lord is still with them and the Lord will go before them into the land. So it wasn't Moses' presence but it was God's presence that will be vital to their survival, no matter who gets past this baton. But how are God's people to be strong and courageous after Moses dies? I mean, you think, well, maybe they can eke by, but how could they be strong and courageous? Moses just gives one reason. We just read it. Moses said, for the Lord your God who goes with you, he goes with you. He, he will not leave you or forsake you. That's all you need to know. So the unchanging God is always present with his people. And so the Israelites can stake their lives with complete confidence that God will always be present with them to fulfill his promises as they walk in his ways. So we continue in verse 7. We'll read through the end of the chapter. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give them, and you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Well, then Moses wrote this law and gave it to the priests, the sons of Levi, who carried the Ark of the Covenant to the Lord and to all the elders of Israel, and Moses commanded them. At the end of every seven years, at the set time in the year of release, at the Feast of Booths, when all Israel comes to appear before the Lord your God at the place that he will choose, you shall read this law before all Israel in their hearing. Assemble the people, men, women, and little ones, and the sojourner within your towns, that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, and be careful to do all the words of this law, and that their children who have not known it may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God, as long as you live in the land that you are going over the Jordan to possess. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, the days approach when you must die. Call Joshua and present yourselves in the tent of meeting, that I may commission him. And Moses and Joshua went and presented themselves in the tent of meeting. And the Lord appeared in the tent in a pillar of cloud. And the pillar of cloud stood over the entrance of the tent. And the Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers. Then this people will rise and whore after foreign gods among them in the land that they are entering. And they will forsake me and break my covenant that I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them, and they will be devoured. And many evils and troubles will come upon them, so that they will say in that day, Have not these evils come upon us, because our God is not with us? And I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil that they have done, because they have turned to other gods. Now, therefore, write this song and teach it to the people of Israel. 
Put it in their mouths that this song may be a witness for me against the people of Israel. For when I have brought them into the land flowing with milk and honey, which I swore to give to their fathers, and they have eaten and are full and grown fat, they will turn to other gods and serve them, and despise me and break my covenant. And when many evils and troubles have come upon them, this song shall confront them as a witness, for it will live unforgotten in the mouths of their offspring. For I know what they are inclined to do even today, before I have brought them into the land that I swore to give. So Moses wrote this song the same day and taught it to the people of Israel. And the Lord commissioned Joshua, the son of Nun, and said, Be strong and courageous, for you shall bring the people of Israel into the land that I swore to give them. I will be with you. When Moses had finished writing the words of this law in a book to the very end, Moses commanded the Levites who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to take this, take this book of the law and put it by the side of the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may be there for a witness against you. For I know how rebellious and stubborn you are. Behold, even today, while I am yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord. How much more after my death? Assemble to me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, that I may speak these words in their ears and call heaven and earth to witness against them. For I know that after my death you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way that I have commanded you. And in the days to come evil will befall you, because you do what is evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger through the work of your hands. <sighs> so this is some heavy stuff as the baton is passed. But again, one of the ways that God reveals his presence among his people is through his chosen leaders. So God's plan for leadership among his people involves God's chosen leaders to commission the next leader whom God has chosen. That is Joshua in this case. Well, step back and look at the big picture. Moses was a hesitant leader at first. Exodus chapter 3 gives the account of when God said to Moses, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Well, Moses kept making excuses, but God simply said, I will be with you. So notice here that God didn't tell Moses that he's smart enough and strong enough and well-educated enough to be a good leader. No, no, God simply said to Moses, I will be with you. But, but this all came out of nowhere for Moses. He's tending his father-in-law's sheep. But there's Joshua, on the other hand. He had the opportunity to observe Moses and Moses' leadership for 40 years in the wilderness. So Joshua was one of the 12 spies that was sent to scope out the promised land. Joshua was a leader in training these 40 years. Well, sometimes God gives his chosen leaders plenty of time <laughs> and plenty of preparation in their eyes for what God has for them. Other times, he surprises them while they're tending sheep like Moses, and you could say David. Well, in any case, God's plan for leadership among his people involves his chosen leaders commissioning the next ones. So at God's leading, Moses then commissioned Joshua in front of everyone and said, be strong and courageous. Then a couple verses later, it says, the Lord also commissioned Joshua and said to him, be strong and courageous. So what's the idea behind your bumper sticker or t-shirt or refrigerator magnet that says, be strong and courageous? Well, the biblical idea behind this is not about Joshua doing his push-ups and eating a healthy breakfast and conjuring up, conjuring up some bravery within himself. The biblical idea of being strong and courageous has to do with the presence and the power of God. So Joshua could be strong and courageous because the Lord was with him and the Lord went before him. So since God is unchanging and God is always present with his people, I ask you, how might your life be impacted if you remember that the Lord is with you and that the Lord goes before you and he's never surprised and he's always at work for your good? Could you be strong and courageous? Yes, you could, because that's what it means. To be aware of the presence and the power of God. I would say the presence and the, the power and the promises of God. How do we do that? Get to know his word. That's how we get to know him. It's how we get to know his power. It's how we get to know his promises. 
So then God's plan for leadership among his people is it involves God's chosen leaders being strong and courageous as they commission the next generation of leaders, the, as they pass the baton to the next ones, whether it's a father to a son, whether it's uh, elders training up new elders, whatever it might be. So really, what might God's plan for leadership look like among his people in his church? Well, each of our ministry team leaders know that one of their primary tasks is to invest in someone who could take their place. So all three of us who currently serve as church elders are investing in uh, at least one, uh, some of us a couple other men, and we don't know what God will do with these uh, ministry team leaders or elders or how God will replace us, whether it's the people we are spending time with right now or not, or if it's in some other church that's being faithful and doing that, and they'll drop that, that God will drop that person here. However he does this, what we do know is that God's intention is that each generation intentionally invests in the next, whether it's in the church or whether it's in the home. So again, I say God is always present with his people. Often the visible presence of that is uh, as his people are pointing uh, others to his word. And so they are to commission the next leaders to do the same, that his church, his work in his church would carry on. So then a third theme we see in Deuteronomy chapter 31 is God's plan for his word to endure among his people. So even though many of the ancient Israelites couldn't read, God ensured that his word endured by putting it in writing. So I thought, how, how can we illustrate this? So sometimes in my uh, role as chaplain with the city of Ripon Police Department, as I'm riding along in a squad car, we park in an inconspicuous place to observe motorists. Maybe you've been observed by one of our city police officers. So, so traffic laws and traffic signs are vital for everyone's safety. So imagine having no stop signs. Imagine having no written traffic laws. Let's say someone drives to an unmarked intersection and they get pulled over and the officer says, you were supposed to stop. And you say, well, who says? Well, it says? And the officer says, well, we have this law that has been passed along by word of mouth that you have to stop here. And the driver says, well, I have this law that's been passed on to me by word of mouth that I don't have to stop here. And both of them can't be right. So if traffic laws and signs were not in writing, you would have to rely exclusively on what you're told. That is to say, the written record is vital. Exodus, second book of the Bible, this written record that God has given, has an account of God writing his own word down. It says, he had finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai. God gave Moses two tablets of stone, that is the Ten Commandments, written with the finger of God. Can you imagine? And then they're broken. Oops. <laughs> Can you imagine? So the Bible is a reliable written record that describes itself as being breathed out by God himself. The Bible also says that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Second Peter. So, so God speaks. Well, God spoke through the Old Testament prophets, but they didn't just speak words and then walk away. They wrote it down. So not only did God speak, but he ensured that his word would endure among his people. So then all of Deuteronomy is this, is this written down, this written record of Moses' final sermon series, and it was to be kept next to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, in, quickly, it's a, a wooden box. It had the stone tablets of the Ten Commandments and a few other items in it to remember God's work. And so it was to be kept next to that box. So then it was God's plan that the tribe of Levi, that is one of the twelve tribes of Israel, and th these priests, would, would, um, they would carry the Ark of the Covenant, they would not have their own land, but that they would live spread out among the other 11 tribes once they got into the Promised Land. Well, why, why would God do that? Well, this is how God ensured that his word would endure, that his commands would be present and central among the people, because the priests are spread out everywhere. So that's God's intention, that it's not just in one specific location, but his word will endure because it is spread out among his people. It is always present among his people. But then once every seven years, they're to gather in the central location and read this whole law. So that talks about the Feast of Booths here. So we saw Deuteronomy 16, God commanded three annual feasts for his people. So they would gather together in some location that the Lord would choose. Eventually it's revealed that it's Jerusalem. But then uh, the Feast of Booths is the third and final one. This was uh, after the, the grape harvest, the olive harvest are completed. So this particular feast was to become this joyous time of celebration that the Israelites would remember back 
of God's provision for them in the wilderness, and then they would rejoice in God's present provision for them in the promised land. So that's the Feast of Booths, happened every year. So then every seventh year at the Feast of Booths, all of Deuteronomy, okay, I've been preaching Deuteronomy for nine months. Imagine gathering for a feast and reading Deuteronomy, okay? So it's to, all of Deuteronomy is to be read aloud in the presence of God's people. So this is part of God's plan to ensure that his word would endure among his people. And we see in the text, there's also two purposes that God gives for reading this law at the Feast of Booths. First, it says God's word was to be read among his assembled people so that they may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God and be careful to do all the words of this law. Second, so that their children may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. So there's something to say here about even passing the baton of leadership that the parents are to be in the presence of the reading of the word with their children and pass it on to them because someday those kids will be parents. So I'm so grateful that God ensured that his word endured. The night before my dad's funeral, I happened upon Psalm 146. And I, I wasn't familiar with it. I was just reading through the Psalms the night before my dad's funeral. And it, Psalm 146 reminded me that God is always present with his people. I was about to recognize that my earthly father was gone. But my heavenly father was always with me. So Psalm 146 brought some real rest to my weary, anxious soul as I entered the territory of the unknown, as the father of a four-month-old. That's the power of God's word. That's the power of God's word. So God gave his word and guarded it throughout the centuries so that you and I can know him rightly. So we don't have to guess what God is like. So I want to encourage you, if Bible reading is new to you, or maybe it's not a regular habit, uh, a daily discipline. I encourage you to start reading in Proverbs every day. Even read chapter 4 today. It's a lot of good stuff. Verse 23 is my favorite one in chapter 4. So I encourage you to just read one chapter each day through the month. This will prepare you for, God will use his word today to work, but it'll also prepare you for our Wisdom for Life series, which, Lord willing, will start in August. We'll be on a journey through the Proverbs. I hate to use the word, but until winter. Until uh, the, the Advent series. The Wisdom for Life will go all the way to winter. So, unless he comes back first, may he, may he do it. So God is glorified when his church makes his word central in our hearts, central in our homes. So every Sunday we gather to read and sing and pray and preach God's word. This is God's plan for his word to endure among his church. So, just recapping, God will always be present with his people as they walk in his ways and he, he will fulfill his promises. So God's chosen leaders are to, to commission the next generation of, of his leaders. And God will ensure that his written word will endure among his people. Well, a fourth theme we see in Deuteronomy 31 is God's plan to deal with rebellion among his people. And so some of that rebellion is within his people, and some of that is, I should say, transplants among his people. So imagine walking in Moses' sandals, though. Let me just, just, just observe the Israelites and Moses and hearing this speech and watching the passing of the baton, just picture what's happening here. Imagine God saying to Moses, hey, you know what? These people you've labored for and loved and led these last 40 years will turn to false gods as soon as you're gone. As soon as you die, it's over. They're just going to be a wreck. So I want to say that whether you're discipling one person or many in the church, whether you're a parent of one child or many, your responsibility is for the input. So God's call in Moses' life was to follow him and obey him, including commissioning up the next leaders and training the Israelites in the way they should go. But Moses was not ultimately responsible for how the Israelites turned out. Well, it's the same for parenting. Those of us who are parents, we're accountable to God for the input. We're accountable to God to train our children in the Lord's ways as he equips us to do so by his word. And by the way, the church's responsibility is to equip the parents to do that. So the enduring principle in Deuteronomy chapter 6 we saw months ago is that God's people are to train their children in the Lord's ways. But again, I say no parent is ultimately responsible for how their children turn out. So Deuteronomy chapter 31 has this good reminder for any of us who are parenting children, any of us who are discipling uh, the next generation of Jesus followers, mentoring anyone, 
We must root our identity in the unchanging character of God, not the choices our children make, not the choices our church people make. So as a pastor, I can really resonate with this Moses. I'm thrilled to see so many of you walking deeply with God, just taking hold of his word. It's such a delight. And yet, I have to guard my identity so that I don't get all proud and excited about how God's at work here and say, Lord, hey, if things are off the rails, just help me to be faithful. Help me to love well. Help me to serve well. So parents, any, any, any role you're in, you're responsible for the input. So God commanded his people uh, to completely destroy the altars of the false gods as soon as they entered the land. Moses knew that. He's the one who told them. Well, all I have to do is just peek into Joshua, just peek into Judges. And you know that they did not do that at all. In fact, they did. Indeed, what it says here, they forsook God and broke his covenant. So, so the pattern we've seen is that God graciously works through discipline to restore him, uh, his people to himself, his people who are truly his. Even in the worst of times, there's always a remnant of God's people. Look at verse 17 and 18. Verses 17 and 18. It speaks of God hiding his face when there's rebellion among his people. There are some psalms that plead with God to make his face shine on his people. So we saw it in Psalm 67 this morning during pastoral prayer. It says, make your face shine on us. Psalm 89, which we read during call to worship, speaks of God's face shining on us. And even one of the songs spoke of that as well. So the idea here of God's face shining is about his presence and his provision for his people, his nearness to his people. So even though God would discipline the Israelites and hide his face from them in their sin, he gave them a song that would urge them to repent. He would not hide his face forever. So then, Lord willing, we'll see next week that the history and the anticipation of God's faithfulness and their rebellion is found in this song that Moses wrote down. It's chapter 32. So this was to be in the mouths of each coming generation. So I encourage you, please do read ahead. But read ahead in great confidence. Read ahead, read chapter 32 this week in great confidence that the Word of God, empowered by the Spirit of God, will do the work of God in the people of God for the glory of God even 3,400 years later. That's how it works. This is God's enduring Word. This isn't just a textbook or an encyclopedia. This is the living Word of God. And He will work in you as you read. So, the Bible has other songs that serve a similar purpose. Uh, Psalm 78, Psalm 106 come to mind. I think I put those in your worship guide in the yellow sheet. So I encourage you to read those this week. Psalm 78 and Psalm 106 both tell the story of this repeated cycle of rebellion and repentance among God's people. So I heard somebody say one time, if you're like me, which I am, <laughs> I just thought it's funny. If you're like me, which I am. You, you recognize yourself in these repeated cycles of rebellion and repentance. So Psalm 78, Psalm 106. It's a blue van in our parking lot that has Psalm 78 as a license plate. So, the, again, I say the Bible, it's about real life and real people. This is real stuff. This is real history told from God's perspective or real anticipation from God's perspective. And the Bible then describes the root cause of all the pain in this broken world. The Bible uses the word sin. Well, it says the Israelites were, were not just capable of great sin, but today's chapter says they were inclined to great sin. God says, I know what you were inclined to. Well, rebellious human nature hasn't changed. And so, so reading those Psalms 78, Psalm 106, uh, um, Deuteronomy chapter 32, they'll assure you, even as you are convicted that human nature has not changed, you'll be reminded that God has not changed either. You'll be assured that he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. So whatever generation we live in, no matter who's carrying or passing or receiving the baton, God's unchanging character can be relied on because he's always present with his people. I look back at my childhood and I said, my, my mom and dad provided a good, safe home for me. I have to say that when my dad traveled for work every once in a while, as a little guy, I was sometimes afraid. But when my dad was around, I, I always felt safe and just strongly loved, like, dad's in the house, it's going to be okay. Well, my earthly father did what he could to pass the baton. And Lord willing, my children will eventually pass the baton of Christian leadership in the home 
to their children. So whatever kind of home you grew up in, whatever your situation is today, know that God the Eternal Son, that is Jesus the Christ, he may not be on earth and he's not on earth present physically, but God the Holy Spirit indwells every one of his people to equip us and empower us and encourage us on this journey. You're never alone. If you're a Christian, you are never alone. The unchanging God is always with his people. Jesus said as he wrapped up his ministry on earth, I am with you always, even to the end of the age, when he commissioned the disciples to go and spread this great news of the gospel. So God is with us. You know what else? We have to remind ourselves, God is with us. On July 18th, when we get to have a neighborhood block party for all, and invite all our, uh, our neighbors to come and enjoy the cookout or hopefully enjoy good weather with us, God is with us. And he's commissioned us to pass on the baton of the gospel, to pass the great news of the gospel. But that doesn't come just by, it could come on occasion by dropping tracks and mailboxes and things like that, but it comes to relationships. As I often say, the most effective ministry takes place in the context of intentional relationships. And so it's another opportunity for us to build relationships with one another and with our community, our neighborhood right here, as we uh, engage them next week in the cookout. So I encourage you to remember that the fact that God is always with you, it's not just for a bumper sticker. It's not just for a fancy refrigerator magnet. It's not just for a t-shirt from the Christian bookstore. It's the enduring reality of the Christian life, now and forever. The unchanging God is always with his people. And if the, if the unchanging God is always with his people, that means his enduring love is always with you. So if you're a Christian, you are never alone, and you are never unloved. You are never alone, and you are never unloved. So you can rest in that. God's enduring love for his people is as enduring as the unchanging God himself.